We are still in Acts chapter 16. We, we got our mission last week accomplished. We got Timothy ready to join his team and, and go on down the road with, uh, with Paul and the rest of the team. And here they are now, and, 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 and I'm glad he covered all of these seemingly contradictions last week, but they're heading out through all the towns where they've been before and established churches, and they are spreading the decree from the apostles back in Acts chapter 15 and encouraging everybody to follow those decisions. And as a result, it says right after that that all those churches were strengthened and growing larger every day. It's amazing how those churches could grow like they did. The only program they had was the gospel. And the only gospel they had was just a little bit that they heard from the witnesses who had been there. Nowadays, we got to have entertainment. Well, what you see is what you get. How sad is that? <laughs> yeah, I don't care. <clears throat> but they are, they're heading out down the road. They're doing all of these neat things. And they're heading down through churches where they've been before. And places like, uh, it says they were, pre they were heading First of all, if you don't look at it real quick, it says they couldn't go into Asia, but they'd already been into what, what they called Asia. They had already had been through some of the province, provinces, Phrygia, Galatia, a lot of what is modern-day Turkey, and <clears throat> they just wanted to keep going on into the rest of what they called Asia, which included Bithynia and Mysia, and they, you know, it's funny. Did you ever have this happen to you? You got your plans made. Your bags are tack, packed, you're ready to pick up your, your schedule and your tickets, and something says you can't do that. I mean, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with planning and preparing, but they were, Paul had his heart set on going into that part of Asia Minor. He wanted to go to Bithynia. I don't know why. Paul knew why. But for whatever reason... Instead of heading for the south side of the Black Sea, the Holy Spirit said, don't go. Now, I wonder if he was like anybody. I've known some people that if, if somebody said, don't go, that's just like saying something to a mule and their feet plant or holler and sick them to a bulldog. You know, they're going to go. But Paul being who he was and being the example that he is and was, listened. The Holy Spirit closed that door twice so they could not go there. So they went west to Troas. And you need to get out a map, but those things are still findable. But while they're on their way going to Troas, Paul has this vision in the night. And it was a man from northeastern Greece saying, come over and see us. Come and tell us. Come and talk to us. Come and share with us. And you know what? He didn't get up and say, well, was it the onions? Uh, maybe it's this Croatian food. They didn't boil something correctly or whatever. No. He saw the vision. He knew it was from God. He got up, packed up again, and they headed for Macedonia. Thank you. So they, now here's, here's the thing, I, I want to hit this in verse 10, just for a minute. Have you noticed the progression of the pronouns? <laughs> I got some looks there. <clears throat> Look at this. <clears throat> and after he, Paul had the vision, immediately we. 
We endeavored to go into Macedonia as surely the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is where everybody believes that Luke joined the team. Because it had been up till now a narration and now it's we. Now it's he, we, and us. So now we've got the guy right there. Luke joined the team. Now it's Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, and whoever else is working with them. The beginning of a number of passages containing we that go on until about the 20th chapter. So here we are. Here's the thing that all this is leading up to. We've been adding people to the team. You know what? If you're doing what you should be doing, people will be added to your team to serve the Lord. But now, here's where so many of us fall apart. We need to expect that if we're doing what the Lord tells us to do, there's going to be problems. But, but, but I'm, I'm doing God's will. I'm, I'm doing what he called me. I'm, do, I'm doing, why are they so mean? There was an old joke in Oklahoma. You probably, I'm sure that Marvin thought this many times. Every Monday morning, pastors resign. <laughs> you think it's funny because you've never been a pastor's wife. You know? <laughs> Every Monday morning, the pastors all resign. How does that work? Doesn't seem to for most of us. We're still there, you know. But it, they, the problems, look, they, they sailed across. You can look this up. There's an island they called Samothracia. We call it Samothrace. They went out and landed in Neapolis. From there on, they went into Philippi, northeastern Greece, Macedonia. Stayed there for several days. And here we see something else, too. Apparently, there was not a synagogue there. And that means there couldn't have been very many Jewish men because it only takes 10 Jewish men to establish a synagogue. But the Jews were meeting down by the river, and uh, so Paul and his team went down by the river, and they started to share with them uh, the gospel. And so, <laughs> you know what happens, men, when you don't show up? The women do it. They're down at the river, and there's apparently not enough men there to make a difference. But there's a lot of women down there at the river. They're doing various things, but they're having a prayer meeting. And here comes the apostle and his group, and they start sharing. And lo and behold, there's a woman there that already worshipped Jehovah. But you know what it says? What does it say in verse 14? like Ben Stein. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. It says that she heard us. Yeah, everybody heard. But she heard them with her heart opened. And she listened to the things that Paul said. I don't know. I, I, I could just stand here and spin my wheels on that verse because the reaction was sad. <laughs> I just, I thought it was pretty cool that this is a woman, she already worshipped God, but here come these guys out of town. Nobody knows who they are. They come down to the river, interrupt whatever the women are doing, start preaching something about something that nobody had ever heard before about somebody nobody knew anything about, and all of a sudden it said, Here's a woman whose heart was open. Yeah, how often do we come to church with our hearts already closed? You know, how, you know what it says to me every time somebody asks me, and I don't care if this hair lips the governor, every time somebody asks me, who's preaching this morning? That tells me things that I don't want to know. That tells me where people's hearts are. Are their hearts open to hear from God, or are they open to hear from me or Clayton or Brandon or Larry? <laughs> yeah, I know. Wave your fans at me. I don't care. <laughs> it's just 
it just causes me to reach for my chapstick. <laughs> but she listened. Her heart was open. She listened to the things that were spoken. And what happened? She became the first recorded convert in Europe. You know what would have happened, hypothetically, if Paul hadn't listened to the Holy Spirit and went ahead and went northeast instead of going west? Uh, west? Chances are we would never have gotten the results of all that. In fact, we might have been lucky enough to have missionaries show up around here coming from the east. But he listened to God. He turned left and went west. And here we got a woman who listened and became the first recorded convert. And along, look, at, she was baptized along with what? Her whole household. You know, I almost took off a little side trip here on the households that got saved. There's at least a 10 or a dozen of them. But how many people do you see reading through the book of Acts? Somebody, they didn't just get saved and go home and, and, and keep quiet. These men and women got saved and everybody in their house had to pay attention. <laughs> oh, I'll go home and nobody's going to make me mad and they're going to hurt my feelings. And I'm, you know. <clears throat> anyway, to show that she really did get converted, she invited those preachers home to eat. <laughs> She invited him home and even said, you can stay here as long as you're going to be in town. You can stay here and do that. So they stayed there a while. And here they are. They're out there for several days. They're walking through town. They're down in Philippi. They're doing whatever. And here they are walking along, just minding God's business. And one day, this woman shows up behind them. Now it says first off that she's demon possessed. The Greek there says that she was under the influence of the spirit of Apollo. I'm not going to go through all the Greek nonsense. But they were figured the spirit of prophecy under the myth, uh, Greek mythology. So in other words, she's demon possessed. <laughs> and she's going along behind them, and what's she doing? What's she doing, verse 17? And she's not just walking down conversationally, speaking to people as she goes by. It says she's crying out. These men are servants of the Most High God, and they're going to show us the way of salvation. You say, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Don't we want all the advertisement we can get? How many evangelists send posters ahead and, 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 and news releases and all of that? Here, here they are. This is going on for a few days, and Paul gets aggravated. Why would he get aggravated? This woman... Every word she's saying is true. We have to talk truth. Every word she says is truth. But what's the motivation behind this demon making this testimony about Paul and his team? If you think about who's behind the demon, it got to figure Satan is out to discredit their message because it makes people think that they are in league with the demon. That she's worked. These, they're cooperating. They're working together. And people already know that she's a demon-possessed medium. And so the first assumption, wouldn't it be that, oh, they're associated. So the same... They're just a different way of saying what the miracles they're doing are coming from over there. And that helps the devil to get people to discount the gospel. Has that changed? No. He's still finding ways to get people to discount the gospel. You know what is the best way to get people to ignore the gospel? 
is the difference between what we say and what we do. That was he wouldn't teach. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, when he cast out the devil in the name of Jesus, that established that they were working for Jehovah God and not for the other guy. And so here, here's the thing. Almost nearly everything I've ever heard of that Satan was behind involved taking somebody's money. It doesn't matter what your addiction is. He's taking your money. It doesn't matter what your problems are. If you give in to them, they're eventually going to cost you money. He's going to take whatever he can from you, and he's going to start with your pocketbook. And here we got, all. Oh, can you imagine what a lucrative business we've got to, with the fortune teller on our payroll? Now all of a sudden, fortune teller can't tell time. <laughs> and so they got mad. The owners of the slave girl got mad. You want to make people mad, touch their pocketbook. I've had people so mad they quit the church when I preached on tithing. <laughs> yeah. They were telling me how to spend my money, bless God. <laughs> okay. But here, the owners of the slave girl find out their source of income is gone. What do they do? They grab them. And they drag them downtown. And they take them before the magistrates. And here's the thing. They say the whole town is in an uproar because of these two people. The whole town. Now, nobody exaggerates when they get excited, right? The whole town. Your kid ever come home and say, everybody's doing it. My dad always said, not everybody, you're not. <laughs> so anyway, that's the whole, and they accused them of promoting customs that were not legal for Romans to accept or practice. Nobody said they had to. But here's the thing. If you haven't been watching your television or reading your newspaper, the crowd joined the attack that these people presented. That hasn't changed. You got a, a handful of people making some kind of an accusation, and everybody within the sound of their voice jumps on the bag wagon, and you got a riot. And here they are. So, in order to get the crowd settled down, the magistrates grab these two, beat them with rods, ouch, which was a normal Roman punishment for misdemeanors, and understand the Jews were the ones that had the rule for 39 stripes. Romans didn't have any kind of rule. It was whatever the guy doing the beating felt like doing. It could be 10 or 50. Didn't matter. But they beat him, put him in the inner dungeon, locked their feet in stocks. You understand the Roman stocks? These wood, they had holes in them that spread their legs like this. So that they were... It would bruise the feet, causing great pain and injury, and that along with beating them with those rods beyond moderation. That's what Paul, remember 2 Corinthians 11, 22? Stripes above measure. Stripes you couldn't count. Ouch. Don't give me 39. <laughs> Same way when people make big sermons out of 39 stripes that Jesus had. Jews didn't beat him. The Romans did. We don't know how many stripes. We know there were a lot. All we need to know is that by those stripes we're healed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, this is in spite of this, in spite of all of the, the beating, the leg, the pain, what happens around midnight when you ought to be moaning and groaning and crying and carrying on or trying to sleep? These two idiots are waking everybody up. They start singing, praising God, 
And all the other prisoners, the Bible says, heard them. They're listening to this. Church, how do you react when you're in pain and agony and poor me and all over town? People are listening. She used to tell our girls, people are watching you. <laughs> you may not think so, but they're watching you. People are listening. They're listening and they're singing hymns and they're, they're having a good time. And all of a sudden, I love them suddenly, don't you? Earthquake. Now, I know my singing ain't good, but it's never caused an earthquake. <laughs> they had an earthquake. Violent earthquake shaking the foundation of the prison. Can I say that that was the original jailhouse rock? <clears throat> no, I'm not going to let their parents handle that. I'm not going to do it. The jailer was responsible. The jailer's life was on the line. He wakes up sees the door standing open. He knows what's in it for him. As soon as somebody finds out what happened, he takes his sword. He's going to take the easy way out because who knows what the government will do to him. <laughs> and Paul, still in the dungeon, still in the inner dungeon, starts hollering at him, don't do that. We're all still here. Somebody lets your prison door open, you're going to... Pshoo! out that door. You're gone. What would happen, Pastor Barth, if something failed electronically in the facility where you work and all the doors popped open? <laughs> but, but, but think about it. Here's this guy. He's the only guy. He's in charge of all of this. And he's going to take the blame. But Paul says, don't do it. We're all... St Why aren't those other people running out? Why aren't the other ones that heard these two clowns over here with their feet all in pain and their legs stretched out and their backs bleeding, singing? Why aren't the rest of them hitting the door? My assumption is they wanted to hear some more of what these guys had to say. And so... Jailer called for lights. He ran in there, and he saw they were all still there, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then when he brought them out, and he says, what can I do to be saved? Whew. Isn't it sad how some of us have to get so far down before we can look up? This guy was in a life-and-death situation. What do I have to do to be saved? And what did they tell him in verse 31? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. <sighs> that word translated believe has nothing to do with up here. It has everything to do with being completely and fully and firmly persuaded. Total confidence in it. First, it means that you have to believe who Jesus is. He's the Son of God, according to John 20, 31. Secondly, it means that you have to believe He died on the cross for the sins of the world, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Third, means that you have to believe what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 4. You guys are so reliant on that, you forgot how to sword drill. <laughs> that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. <clears throat> To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing who he is and what he did. Is that enough? Well, get a grip, because I'm going to say no. 
Nobody can receive Jesus as their Savior unless they also recognize him as Lord. And that makes the words, no Lord, an oxymoron. Because if he is the Lord, you can't say no. It's mutually exclusive. And yet, <laughs> the New Testament makes it so clear. Listen, every time Jesus is called Savior in the New Testament, for that saying, he is called Lord at least ten times. He's only called Lord or Savior twice in the book of Acts. Acts 5.31 and Acts 13.23. He's called Lord over 20 times. Paul and Silas speak the word of the Lord to the jailer and all that is in his house. <clears throat> they explain what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as Savior and Lord. And at that hour of the night, the jailer takes care of them, takes care of their wounds, and then everyone in his household are baptized immediately. Somebody run and get the buckets. We're going to have a baptism right now. Well, you got to make, you got to sign up on the sign up sheet. We got to fill the baptistry. We got to put. They immediately were baptized. Jailer then showed how much that meant to him. He brought them into his house. These are criminals. And he put a meal before them. And he rejoiced. Because he and his whole household believed. Just an hour, just hardly any time before that, he's ready to commit suicide. And now he's rejoicing in the Lord. Why? Because he experienced what it says in Psalm 32 and 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. <gasps> Next morning, I'd love to see this. Next morning, city officials send somebody with a message, call it the police, whoever, to tell the jailer, go ahead and let them go. Jailer goes right and tells Paul and Silas, hey, you guys are cool. You can go in peace. Paul says, ain't no way. <clears throat> I'm leaving here. We have been beaten and put in prison without a trial. Roman law does not allow for a Roman citizen to be done anything to without a trial. And so these, these innocent police officers go back and tell the magistrates, these guys are Roman citizens. <laughs> and you see them swallow their tongues. Hey, yeah, I think it would be uh, an understatement to say they were alarmed. <laughs> but... They, they degraded them publicly. They beat them publicly. They threw them in jail publicly without any kind of even a hearing. And so think of the danger they are in. <gasps> think of the, and so they come to the jail in person and say, hey guys, you know, kind of an oops there, you know. <laughs> Can we get you to leave town, maybe, and we won't say any more about it? And they didn't leave town. 
See, these people should have, Philipp, Philippi was a colony. That meant that people born there or had been there when it became a colony were Roman citizens. They should have been the first thing they thought of. Just because they came from out of town, it mean they weren't also born in a free state. So, what did they do before they left town? We're almost done. They went back to Lydia's house, and what did they do with the brethren there? Would you think if anybody needed comfort, wouldn't you think it was you? You'd been so misused and so, so terribly treated. It says they went, he went back to Lydia's house and comforted them. Yeah. Then they left. Apparently it's right about here that the we passages stop. And there's people who want you to believe that Luke stayed behind and others say, yeah, he didn't. He doesn't appear any more wheeze again until Acts 20, as I said earlier. But it, just think about the success, and I'm going to quit, of this church at Philippi. Think of what a throw, growing, thriving church it was because it was supporting Paul's ministry. What did he say to them when he wrote his letter to them? Philippians 1 and 3. I thank my God every time I think of you. And you think, boy, wouldn't you want to get this to leave that behind you? Forget about it. But he thanked God for the church at Philippi every time he thought of it. And just kind of an aside there, later on in 2 Timothy 4.11, when he asked for them to go back and get Mark, remember Mark, he caused all the problems in the first place, the wrong thing. It says, nobody's with me but Luke. Send me Mark, because he's good for what I need. Amen? Church, there's so many things that the church is called to literally change the world. But we have to understand that to do that, we need to gather people together, and we need to expect to have to overcome problems, but we have to encourage each other and any new believers. Amen? And I haven't looked at my calendar to see who's on next week, and it doesn't matter because it may be wrong. <laughs> God bless you, and thank you again tonight for coming. Putting up with this again. Just think next week, whoever it is, you'll have good teaching. So, okay? God bless you, and thank you. Let's stand one more time if you can. Yes, dear. Ron's home. Ron is home. Praise God forever. Give the Lord a hand. Yeah. I'll never understand why we act so surprised when God answers prayer. If we believe what we say and say what we believe and somebody comes along and say, God answered my prayer. <gasps> Whatever. Bonnie, would you dismiss our service, please? <laughs>